welcome, good evening from London, uh, to show studios live panel discussions. Um, most of you know the drill by now, but I am Del Choda, and I'm going to be with you for the next 45 minutes with a uh, wonderful selection of panelists, um, all again fresh graduates from Central St Martins, uh, the School of Fashion Communication. So um, we are going to talk about couture. Um, and in particular, uh, the relevance of couture in the digital age. So that's a kind of broad summation of what we're going to try and unpack today. Obviously, looking at some of the recent shows, um, Margiela's show or the release of the video was actually a couple of hours ago. So hopefully everybody here has had a chance to look at that. Um, but before we get into that, uh, each of the panelists are going to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about um, the work they've just been doing. So let's start with you, Jana. Hi, I'm Jana Shibley. I just graduated from BA Fashion Journalism at Central St. Martins. Um, and my final major project was a magazine. It was a, uh, or is a Sunday style magazine. So I kind of took inspiration from the Sunday supplements that come with your newspaper um, and kind of made it new. Um, and the theme of the first issue is opulence. Very good. Opulence is a, a good introduction, I guess, to Couture. So um, we'll be interested in how Robe will cover the shows. Uh, Juliette. Hi, I'm Juliette Bastien. I'm from France and I just graduated from fashion journalism in Saint-Louis and Martins as well. Um, and for my final major project, I did a magazine called Madeleine. Um, it was a bit like a Prussian Madeleine. So it was all about perfumes, nostalgia and a bit of fashion as well. And I was digging into the black lashes of um, the COVID pandemic in an olfactory way, in a way. Mm. Nice. Well, talking of the COVID pandemic, um, let's go to you, Yasha, who uh, currently has COVID, <laughs> sadly. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> apart from that. Um, Maya, so, that was a nice little uh, transition. <laughs> um, Maya, hi, I'm Yasha. I've just graduated from fashion history and theory at St. Martin's. And um, my final project was a dissertation that explored the ideas of originality, assessing its meaning and its relevance in the 21st century. And um, I looked into, I spotlighted like mainly Raf Simmons' career, but also touched upon like Virgil Abloh and sort of looked into how their own admissions and interviews related to what they were actually presenting on the catwalk and how that was sort of accepted by people and whether um, originality is as fixed as perhaps thought or if it's got more fluidity to the term and what it yeah what it means today. Nice and Matthew? Hi I'm Matthew Simon um, I've just graduated from fashion history and theory at Centre St Martins. Um, for my final project I wrote a dissertation about um, minimalist fashion um, starting from its kind of like post-war beginnings through to um, its apogee in the mid to late 1990s um, I wanted to kind of like investigate its relationship with like whiteness in a racialized sense as well as a, an aesthetic sense before kind of like understanding how designers of colors can fit into minimalism as we know it. Brilliant. And Alberto. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Alberto Agosti and I just graduated from uh, fashion communication and promotion. I try to specialize in art direction and for my final major project I tried to and I did art direct uh, this magazine and I tr the question that the magazine wanted to ask the audience and I wanted to ask myself was what is it we consider beautiful today and why do we consider it beautiful? Wonderful. So really big questions that you guys are answering and you can uh, access all of the projects as you've been seeing on the screen um, at a later date and those of their colleagues have also graduated. So there's some really exciting new ideas happening here. Um, and it's really through those ideas I really want to filter this idea of couture because it is very much an idea. It's an abstract idea as well. It's a sort of world that many of us um, will never access or have access to or may even desire to have access to in a sort of, uh, let's call it a post-pandemic world, but we probably are still living in a pandemic in some senses. Um, but I wondered, I mean, this idea, I was talking about this earlier with a colleague of mine, and the word relevance was something that stuck in our heads um, about uh, what that word means and how important that is when we are assessing fashion. Um, over the last few years, I think a lot of the fashion writing and a lot of the fashion criticism quite often has been through this vein of, is this relevant? But I wonder what we mean when we are asking about relevance. So Jana, I'll come to you first. What is relevant? What are we looking for? What do we mean when we say, is this relevant? I mean, 
I think, especially if you look at couture, if you look at relevance in kind of the strictest sense of, is this piece of clothing going to be on your body or on the body of a lot of people? It's not, so you could kind of look at it in that way. But I think fashion has had such a big influence and so many people have kind of been really, really interested in the world of fashion as well. So in that way, you could kind of look at relevance too. Mm. Alberto, what do you think? Is couture relevant? I think that, uh, so the first time I wrote the title, the first thing that came to my mind is like, uh, it's kind of an oxymoros in the sense that relevance and especially for the digital world and couture, they're just the opposite. Like they stand for two completely different things. Couture is about craftsmanship, is about, uh, it's an art form. Uh, it's about privilege, whereas whatever it is digital, it's supposed to be the opposite of this, or at least. So is it relevant? First of all, I think it depends who do you ask this question? Like who is the person that answering? Mm. But for sure, I feel like it's interesting to see how, especially now after COVID, we had so many, so many, we had a few brands that started focusing on couture and it's kind of like an opposite, like we are in a period of crisis, but at the same time, we are focusing a lot on couture. And I think yeah. that's also the only answer that you have, because yeah. it has two different targets. Yeah. Who here is excited about um, the possibilities of, of the digital age um, and what that's meant for design and fashion in particular? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Tell definitely. us why. And I mean, I think or I guess I'm looking at it more from like my perspective, but for people watching fashion, um, it's just meant access and uh, more access. And it kind of depends. I mean, I think a lot of, for me, a lot of the collections that have been shown via a video, it's been very, it's felt very removed. Um, but then when you have live streams like the Balenciaga one, it feels like you're right there and you're seeing things that you would only see if you were actually there in, mm. in a world before. So. Mm. Yeah, I think in that way, it like moving more towards the, dig the digital is really, really interesting. Mm. I think just to pick up again on what Alberto was saying about digital and couture, almost maybe with the digital age almost canceling out that oxymoron kind of idea. For me, I think, you know, there are some designers, uh, Iris Van Herpen in particular, who talks a lot about the making of fashion. Um, you know, years ago, she once told me, why would you sit at a sewing machine uh, with a needle and thread when you can do so many other things to make clothes? So namely 3D printing is what she was focused on a long time ago. And I think that is still a big part of her work. Um, and uh, we can look at her collection in a second where she collaborated with a skydiver. And rather than with the making of the clothes, we was thinking very much about, I guess, the uh, the extravagance and the delicateness of couture, the kind of refined air that we often expect to see with couture garments, you know, these very, you know, traditionally, traditionally intricate pieces. Um, and she has fashioned this garment that, you know, was then worn by a skydiver who's jumping out into the sky. Um, and she talks to Vogue Runway very much about how some of the technical challenges involved in creating something that was very light and very beautiful, but actually could withstand such a physical activity. Um, but I'm again interested again in, in this idea of digital um, craftsmanship, which is the age I think we're living in. I think it's something that Show Studio has pioneered for a long time. Um, but it's this idea of actually using digital technology to further the making of, of dreams and making more dreamlike scenarios, which is again, these words, there are several words that keep coming up when you talk about couture, aren't there? What are those words before I tell you what I think they are? What are the words that you all saw when you were kind of talking or thinking about couture, Matthew? Um, I was gonna say a lot of people always, you know, associate with like fantasy, escapism, opulence, drama, all that kind mm. of stuff. Um, and are those words that you feel are still relevant today? Um, I mean, to some designers, yes. Like, I think a lot of the time when people think they're, you know, kind of going to make a couture collection, they kind of get bogged down by the idea of what couture is supposed to be rather than what it could be. Um, you know, in the way you see designers kind of referencing a very kind of 1950s, 19, like, you know, post-war kind of like silhouette, that's kind of, a, you can see, you know, there in that moment, they've kind of been bogged down by the idea of I need, I'm presenting a couture collection, so it needs to look a certain kind of way. Mm. Um, I think though some designers have shown that you don't need to kind of like think that you can think you can approach it in a completely different way. 
I mean, it's like such a bit of a, it's a bit of a cliche kind of answer at this point, but when Raf Simmons was creating um, Couture, I don't think those were kind of like questions on his mind of, but I need to be thinking what, what was Couture and like, how can I make a 1950s silhouette like today? It could just be something that's much more modern, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yasha, did you look much at Raf's um, women's wear in your-, in your Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, a lot of it. Well, uh, not a lot of it, most of my chapter two. Um, so chapter three was about his uh, debut collection at Dior. So yeah, I definitely did. But I think um, like so far, like I agree with what everyone's sort of been saying. I think it is interesting, like the idea of digital and couture with the whole accessibility and then like exclusive sort of market. But um, I think, oh, sorry, I've literally completely lost my whole train of thought there. Um, <laughs> no, it's gone. Hold that on. happens. Sorry. What did you what did you th- what did you think of Vera van Herpen's collection? Actually, yeah, I think um yeah, no, I think like the whole idea of a couture skydiver is insane. Like how like couture is a lot about craftsmanship and the idea of making something that can withstand, you know, falling that high and you still look like elegant and it still works. And I think a lot of couture as well, like people want to see movement in clothes and I mean I don't know if you can get more movement than falling through the sky but yeah um I think it was like an interesting season because I think there's a lot of talk about how the pandemic and Covid obviously you kind of want couture like couture's a lot of the time it's the part of the industry that like really excites people it's where really like you can do sort of what you want and it's like the best of the best that's kind of like what people want to see like they want to see extravagance and then I think like oh, sorry my pants just fell um and I think coming into this season, like a lot of people might have wanted to have like that element of escapism where, you know, we've been sort of stuck in for so long. Like we want to see what sort of when creativity has been tested, what people can come up with. And then I think it was really interesting that we're in like this sort of period where it can shift. And like with Balenciaga, you know, like the like denim look or something, it's like pieces that. Um, might not necessarily be couture like maybe if you didn't mix them with like the Philip Tracy hats like maybe that wouldn't necessarily come across as couture but it's also interesting because it's sort of like the clientele is also shifted and what ideas of luxury and couture is also very different now because people yeah they think they want luxury and couture in every aspect and like high quality in every aspect of their wardrobe not necessarily like I don't think the focus is just necessarily on gowns anymore. Mm. Let, let's go to the elephant in the room that is Balenciaga because I mean it's the one that everyone's itching to talk about. Um, it was a very highly anticipated show. It was three years in the works, this collection, and this idea of, of how uh, Balenciaga would come back to the chore schedule. Um, uh, Juliet, did it give you what you wanted? I, it was far, like, I was amazed. I think he perfectly paid an homage to Crystal Ball legacy but he also I don't know it was a perfect balance between paying an homage and re- kind of reinventing it for modern couture so with his touch I mean that's why he's been appointed at the head of, uh, of the house now because of his complete opposite world from uh, Cristobal but I don't know it kind of works at the end it creates something mm-hmm. really intriguing like there is a good alchemy happening there um, so yeah to me to me he just he took up the challenge really bright, bright. It was brilliant. Um, mm. <laughs> what did you have a favorite look or look that stays in your mind? Not the looks, but the hats, the, the yes. matador hats. That was, I don't know, it, it just gave um, a perfect balance to the silhouette as well. Um, yeah. And there was a bit of a mystery happening because the, the face was half covered. And I know his models are already well known for being a bit monstrous, like this is how they are described. Um, so yeah, it's a good hide and seek happening there. The hats, mm. the matador hats, would definitely mm-hmm. go to. Who, just out of interest, who describes them as monstrous? That's an interesting, interesting word. Um, that's something I've read somewhere. I don't. It's been a while ago. Um, I've read that um, the people he, the the models he used for his shows. Um, I know some some are not speci- specifically models. They are people yes. he in the street. I think that was back in twenty twenty. Yeah. He, people in the street or um, artists or whatever people they were. Um, I haven't checked for that one, uh, if that was still happening again, but mm-hmm. I know he's kind of breaking the beauty myth in a way with the very thin model, the high cheekbones. No, he, mm. 
I don't know, he's designing, he has his will, yeah, which is really clashing with uh, the Balenciaga dusty image we could have. Yes. I think what's interesting, the thing that disappointed me about the collection a little bit, though, is is the casting. I did feel like some of the models looked very vulnerable um, and which is kind of totally opposite to the way that I feel about what um, ba Balenciaga is under Demna, what Couture is generally, you know, there's this kind of strength. And, and I think this goes back to Jana's point, maybe it was about digital and the kind of opening up of, of these images and these stories, because obviously more people can access them. Um, and I found that when I watched the live stream, and those of you that haven't watched the show that we're watching right now, it was done in complete silence. So what was really wonderful is the rustling of fabric, you know, the kind of knees rubbing together and the things kind of grazing the carpet, all of those sorts of very tactile sounds it's like ASMR, if you like, Couture ASMR was, was beautiful. Um, and even hearing the sound of people's cameras kind of taking, I can't believe people haven't turned that off, but a lot of people don't know how to do that on their iPhones. But, you know, the kind of clicking sound, I thought was hysterical. But I thought there were some instances where the models were sort of stumbling and they didn't look, you know, they looked a little bit lost. Um, and that really killed it for me. Um, but then when I went back and looked at the actual lookbook and the images, that's where there was, a, that's where I understood what was happening. You know, that felt very, very powerful to me as a still image. And maybe this is something about a lot of these couture gowns. We tend to only access them as still images. We'll see them in museums. You know, we don't see them in red carpets. We don't see them, uh, or you see them flat in a magazine. You never really see it in three dimensions. So it worked as a photograph, but for me kind of seeing the models navigating this kind of beautiful space. Um, yeah, it kind of killed, it kind of took things, took me out of it. Alberto, what do you think? I think that, um, so I was very excited about it. Like I was dying to see it. Uh, and I feel like the presentation, so with way they decided and the fact that they hyped us a lot by deleting everything on the Instagram and then all around Paris, there is just like, a white page written Balenciaga Couture, so like you expect a lot. Uh, but then I'm not sure that the, the collection screams Couture. Mm -hmm. Like also, where they, it has been commented, I think they were uh, demo, um, no, it doesn't come out, democratized, uh, them has democratized fashion with this Couture runway. But then I don't feel like it has exactly done that. <laughs> Well, I don't think you can, dem you know, democratize couture. Exactly. The whole thing is, is ridiculous. You know, to say that is doesn't make any sense. But yeah, they, you know, that's not what this is sure. about. Yeah. But um, Matthew, go on. Finish. No, 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 no. It was just saying at the same time, the look I feel like is there such a difference compared to his ready to wear from just looking because, of course, like we weren't there, so we can't appreciate the 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 elements that you can only appreciate if you're there. I'm not sure that had that much of a gap in between. Mm. Matthew, what did you think about it? Because I'm really interested in, again, in your research into minimalism, because to me, there's a real kind of uh, rigor to what Demna does and particularly to Balenciaga, you know, it's very architectural, it's very sculptural, you know, these words that we use very often to describe hoodies and sweatshirts these days, because that's all we can really find on catwalks. But there is a sense of minimalism to this. Um, would you agree? Um, no, absolutely, absolutely. I was thinking about it um, a lot of, I think it's one of those things of looking at the collection, um, I, was, I was impressed by it a lot, actually. Um, and like, I, it's taken me a while to kind of understand, I guess, like what Dan is doing at Valenciaga. But um, looking to like the shapes and everything like that, it was very minimal and kind of like harks back to that kind of whatever's considered to be the golden period of couture in the sense of like, you know, kind of like the pursuit of some a, a new kind of shape, I guess, and like architectural cut and like kind of appropriating ideas from like that uh, American minimalist art like practice and like putting that into clothing and you see it all within this collection. Um, my initial thoughts on the whole collection itself, I thought it was kind of like erotic in like a really kind of like, um, it sounds really it's almost like at odds with each other, but I thought it was quite erotic in the sense of, you know, when you mentioned, you could hear the kind of like the denim, the vinyl, the leathers and like, you know, mm. kind of nylon rubbing up against itself. I thought that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember reading something um, when I first started at Central St. Martins about how men in the kind of um, 19th century, like the kind of, um, I think, actually I think it was like the Victorian period, um, 
thought the kind of sound of a woman's dress kind of dragging across the floor was quite an erotic experience. And I thought mm. that was quite interesting to think of that, like, you know, within the context of the show. Um, and I, going back to what Alberta said as well about, you know, whether there was a kind of um, enough distance between the ready to wear and the couture, I did think it was really interesting that Demner and like the team at Balenciaga was still kind of revisiting the ideas that they've had over the year, over Demner's, Dem Demner's tenure at Balenciaga. It's a bit of a tongue twister to say that. Um, mm just in the idea of like you know the trench coat the kind of like the jacket that's falling off the shoulder and revealing the nape of the neck in like a couture kind of way but just actually now instead of making ready to wear that kind of aped couture bringing that all back into like a full circle and being like i'm presenting it back to you as actual couture now mm. i mean they said the press release and it mentioned informal concepts are transformed into more glamorous arenas that's kind of how they put it um but i wondered uh i, I again i was thinking you know i didn't i my immediate reaction was I don't need the denim. Like I didn't need that in there. But again, as with anything, once you read more, the denims were all um, knitted or woven on antique looms. So of course, at couture level, everything is made in an incredibly uh, specific and, and, and labor intensive way. That's essentially what you're investing in when you buy a piece of couture, if indeed you're allowed to. Um, you know, it used to be the fact that not everybody was allowed to buy couture. You know, you had to sort of be, uh, um, you know, signed off on a list. It's like buying contemporary art, really. Um, and so I wonder if there's been an easing of the client list also. Um, Jana, did it give you what you wanted? Yeah, I mean, I honestly kind of appreciated that awkwardness that mm, you got okay. in the live stream because it just, it felt so real. And so something that we've been missing, kind of that idea of walking into a room. And I think that's so couture that that idea of walking into a room and and having an impression on people and feeling um, comfortable in yourself and what you're wearing. And I think a lot of clients, I mean, I don't know, but from like documentaries that I've watched, they kind of talk about being in this kind of cocoon and mm. and being enveloped by a fabric that makes you feel a certain way. And I I just thought that was, I don't know, it's something that we've been missing and and that kind of came across in that show really well, but also, it was kind of was missing because you felt that awkwardness that maybe you're not supposed to feel when you're wearing a garment that's you know a hundred thousand pounds or something like that so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and there was this kind of there's this kind of a, a humanness weirdly to the presentation so that awkwardness that Jan is talking about but also the kind of sense of the silence the kind of noises are the sort of coughs or their camera phones or they're sort of every these sorts of our senses have been dulled obviously over the last year and a half and there's a great hunger for experience uh you know that's um physical and and out in the world so i think the reactions um you know an anecdotally friends of mine that were there told me lots of people cried you know at the show because it just felt i think the 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 kind of um the, the nature of the room being silent would have made quite a lot of difference. It's super awkward to sit in a silent room, even though this thing is happening, you know, for 15 minutes or that would have created again another tension. And I always think that that's the one thing that uh, live streams or videos, you know, we're getting it secondhand. We're not obviously always going there. Um, I think also, I think it was Alberta that mentioned, you know, it's, it's kind of these clothes are different to what we get normally from Demna. And I'm interested, let's look at Alaya now, which opened Couture Week. So has again, another kind of exciting moment, but Peter, um, the new creator director or artistic director, I, I believe um, uh, is the correct title, uh, made some kind of interesting comments in interviews in the run up to the opening of the show, where he almost made a dig at brands who have branded sweatshirts and, you know, hoodies and, you know, hats and sly pool slides, which all felt like a bit of a, a dig at Balenciaga to me. Um, it could pick any, insert any label here. But I thought that was very telling. So uh, Peter essentially said to the CEOs of the company that you're not going to get that from me. That's not what Alaya should be. That's not what we're going to do. So he did this instead. Um, Yasha, what did you think of this? Yeah, no, um, I like the collection. I think he, well, I think like Alaya obviously is someone who really knew how to dress the female body, understood like the female form. And I think, yeah, it wouldn't have made sense to come out with a load of branded hoodies, which I think was quite, an in like I didn't actually realise he said that, but I think that was quite an interesting thing as obviously he's worked with like Raph Simmons, who is someone <laughs> who, used, who does a lot of hoodies and wear like that so but yeah no I think it was interesting as well I think it's interesting to do a ready wear collection that also 
for Xander Couture. And like we were saying, I don't know whether um, that would have been something, sorry to bring them up again, but that would be something that might have worked better with like Balenciaga. But yeah, I think it was, uh, I think as well, doing it sort of um, in the location, literally outside of the building, there was a lot where it was quite obvious where, you know, this was sort of like a tribute collection in a way. And I think it was good to do that because I don't think you would have been able to escape that. Mm, Obviously, sure. like with the circumstances. But, you know, overall, yeah, I did. I like the collection. And, and Juliet, what did you think of, of what Peter may be saying about women through these clothes? I think he was, um, he was quite loyal to the way Elia designed the clothes themselves, so very fit to the body. I mean, there's this one purple look with a very high crop top and a, a very a very narrow-waisted um, skirt with a lot of uh, feathers at the end. The feathers, yes, exactly, towards the end. That marked me when I saw it. I mean, yeah, that's, that, I can tell you someone, yeah. Le- exactly. It's fabulous. I mean, it's literally underlining the, the ideal woman curves in a way, but you can you cannot help being mesmerized in a way by this. So mm. I don't, I don't know what he says about women. I think he's just, trying to tune the Alaya chan- the, the, the silhouette in a way. Um, but I think, I, I do think he did a great job. I mean, this look, honestly, I'm still, I'm still mesmerized by it. I yeah, know. I mean, watching, if you watch it in movement, it's even more of a kind of a, a real, it's a real superstar moment, um, this outfit. But I did wonder if, if, it, if it sort of, you know, Alaya does represent quite a traditional idea of woman and femininity and even the hourglass shape and you know but there was a real misstep for me in the casting again because I just needed to see women that naturally have that shape but they don't need that shape put into the clothes because a lot of these girls don't necessarily um, have that hourglass shape it's the clothing that's built to give them that which is what Eli did really well but I thought it, it's a bit of a misstep to not necessarily present a slightly more um, diverse uh, understanding of of the sorts of uh, things that we are saying are beautiful, you know, the kind of types of women, the archetypes of women that we're that we're holding to account, and um, that just felt a little bit dated for me. Alberto, what did you think? I don't know whether I may, again I may be being too oversensitive, but I'd rather be that than actually just blindly kind of think, well, it was all beautiful because of course it was beautiful and of course it was very sensitive. But I wondered if if we need a label like this to do more, do we expect more? from these brands um, and it is indeed a brand now. Alberto, what do you think? I 100% agree, but I feel like it's something that is not necessarily strict to the casting of a liar, but in general, in the whole uh, couture week, the diversity inside the couture world, I think it's not something that uh, it's really spread. And also for me, something that I noticed is that how men's especially, is mm. still considered so traditionally. Like, mm. if uh, there is some menswear pieces inside any of the shows, uh, then it's like a tra- really traditional uh, menswear piece, which I really don't understand. Especially like from, I was actually um, expecting that from Balenciaga to challenge it even more. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you when you're saying what you're saying about the casting of Elia. It, fe- it felt just a little bit dated. Yeah. Matthew, what did you think? Um, I was gonna say I first of all I love a liar. I'm like I think I love him. <laughs> yeah. But um in terms of the show, I thought it was like really, really um I mean like when you whenever you hear people talk about a liar or like the experience of like wearing a liar itself, they're like the dresses are like indestructible or like you know, they can like stand up by themselves kind of thing. You know, I think Vanessa Friedman of the New York Times said something like the dress literally can stand up by itself, you know. Mm. And like looking at those clothes, I, I didn't kind of get that. It was nice to look at, um, but I just felt like it was literally almost like a little bit of an over-reliance on like the fluid atelier, which is like the opposite of like, you know, like tailoring, you know? So it's like, everything just seemed a little bit too flimsy, you know? Um, I mean, I, I'm, often when, you know, you think about a liar again, like, you know, you think about like, you know, people always say that he loves women, and like, you know, that's like a bit of a trope within fashion, but, very much so like he like loved women but didn't have any fantasies about what a woman like you know can or cannot be or like you know present pushing his own idea of what a woman should be onto onto a woman 
mm. I, I just felt like some of that was a bit like a lot a bit lost in that if that makes sense like mm. the idea of like you know wearing a liar should feel almost like you're wearing armor like you know it can protect you against like pretty much but with this for something that was supposed to be like a bit of like a battle cry it came off like a bit of a whisper instead mm. nice. um let's look at um Jem Bastavali. Um, just because I was thinking again about if you close your eyes and you think what's couture, I think you pretty much come up with sort of Jan Bastavali. Um, but what I enjoyed about Jan Bastavali um, is the presentation. So there was a video of this. Um, I think it was shot in Paris in a skate park and the music again was pretty brilliant. We can't play the sound for you sadly, but please do go and watch it. But it really kind of added a whole new uh, context to these garments that of course are never going to be worn in that context but I think it allowed you to assess them slightly differently I wonder what you all thought about it and essentially what I'm saying is is the close your eyes think of couture you think of this big frou-frou gowns fantasy you think of tulle you think of these incredible bow hairstyles you think, I mean it just it serves all of those those things um Jana what did you make of it yeah I mean like you were saying it kind of it's kind of what you expect from couture, which is also, I, I guess that's that's needed, um, but that also doesn't make it super interesting to me, to be yeah. honest. Um, okay. I did think it was interesting that there were, I think there were a few menswear looks um, yeah. and also that they showed outside. I think that was a big theme anyway, <laughs> being outside um, during all of the shows. So and, yeah. and to Alberto's point as well, the menswear was pretty classic, right? Tailoring that it riffs off the dinner jacket or um, dinner suiting. So it wasn't really pushing pushing the envelope there. But I wondered, I do feel like that's something that we often look down upon designers who just make beautiful dresses. Um, I, when I say we, I mean the industry. I think there is this kind of uh, immense snobbery around the discussion of fashion because you're absolutely right. This is not necessarily interesting, but it's beautiful. I'm always really fascinated in friends of mine that, you know, work in fashion and dress in an amazingly cool whatever way all the time. But when they want to get when they get married, it's always the same kind of dress. You know, it's always a beer wang or it's always, uh, you know, it's white and it's big and it's not necessarily was fluffy, but there's some traditions that are just ingrained in us from childhood, which hopefully we're kind of changing some of those things. Um, but they, they were seeing, everyone seems to revert back to this sort of prettiness and this idea of what is pretty comes up a lot within couture. I wonder, Juliet, what do you think about this? This kind of prettiness, this overt, quite traditional femininity, is that relevant today? I think, well, old couture in its essence is basically dressing up um, people that can afford it. And people who can afford it are celebrities going on the red carpet, uh, royal, royal people, um, people that are, appearing on the public space a lot and they have an image to, to preserve in a way. So these people are wearing couture, but they cannot afford to wear, I don't know, John Galliano craziness or they, so yeah, they have to, most of the dresses we see on the red carpets are from, um, I mean, we could see definitely um, mm. value on the red carpet because it's, it's, it's a bit sleek. It kind of, I don't know, it does the job basically. It's pretty, it, it will, give the actress some, um, I don't know, is, she's going to be noticeable, but not too much, you know, she's, I don't know, it, it does the job, basically, so there yeah. has to be some, because not every actress wants to stand out, not every royal people can afford, and it, well, shocking or whatever, so, yeah, yeah. they are answering to a need, basically, yeah. so, that, that's but, what is this preserved femininity and prettiness, I think. But I love that, that you're kind of you're kind of flatlining all of the fantasy and just going, it does the job. And I think that's a very important thing to remember when you are looking at fashion, particularly couture, you know, um, we're not talking about gowns that are going to be, you know, changed the way we think necessarily. But these are gowns that will be bought for parties or for very important moments in, uh, if we're talking about women's wear in particular, in a, in a woman's life, a very wealthy woman who, you know, will want to look her best and whatever her best is of course is, is questionable to all of us we can all have an idea on that but generally there is this kind of level of um femininity prettiness opulence glamour that people are, are looking for and i think Vali is often overlooked because it serves that immediately i did really enjoy the makeup too the pink faces i think are hysterical um but super fun but this leads me on seamlessly to dior um 
now um Dior is a label that is um I always enjoy when there's a Dior show because you know Twitter um fashion Twitter kind of sets itself on fire and has a great time uh, unpacking what Maria Grazia Curie has presented. Um, why I wanted to go onto this now is because you talked about it does the job. And I think Maria Grazia Curie has done the job for a very long time and very successfully for her customer and for her audience. Now that, that may not necessarily translate in into the sorts of things we might want to see, but Matthew, what did you make of Dior? Um, I... Um, I noticed um, in the tweed section, I think that was the most interesting to me just because it kind of like creates a link between my dissertation. Um, I noticed a lot of like uh, Courage, like Cardin and like Bonnie Cashin in like, you know, the kind of like the horse riding cap and like, you know, the architectural shapes of the tweeds. And I know a lot of people on Twitter were saying, we don't need to sit, ever see tweed again. It's like, oh, sometimes, sometimes tweed's nice, you know. Um, I think with Maria Grazia, like, she's one of those people that you know she obviously divides opinion but I think she st still serves a purpose you know um like you were saying there is a very much a customer that doesn't want to just look pretty you know some people are chasing like the idea of like shape some people are chasing the idea of like embellishment and I think she designs for the people that want embellishment almost like you know the kind of like 3,000 hours going into like this you know um sheer organza like your know, skirt and stuff like that you mm. know um but yeah I mean the for me of the duo, I mean, if I was going to go to Dior, it'd always be for the bar jacket. So the kind of like stuff that mimics that shape, I always thought those were more interesting as well as the tweed. I'd say. Mm. Yana, what did you make of it? Yeah, I think there was a kind of somberness to it somehow that was different from other collections that she's done, um, and kind of a focus on on craftsmanship again, and and kind of like texture and the heaviness of that as well. So I think that's. And, and the walls. <laughs> and the um, walls, which were, yeah, designed by an artist uh, called yeah. Ava Justbin, um, who, yeah, I mean, again, I think a big focus for, for this collection, um, they said, was very much about the textile and the tapestry and the hand loom and the making of, of things. Um, and also after, I think, three or four seasons of doing videos and quite elaborate videos, um, I think the kind of somberness maybe on is coming through in the fact that it was essentially a runway show. What was very interesting again though is that after the show this space was open to the public so the public um, could go in and, and experience the walls as as works of art which is indeed what they are. Um, so that I thought was interesting but Yasha what did you make of these clothes? What do they do for um, you? I mean I like the walls, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think it was really like, I think it was quite muted. Like I think in regards to obviously there was like a big focus on the fabric and craftsmanship, like that was all pointed, but like that was all them boxes were ticked. But I think from like sort of as well, the research I was doing for my dissertation, it's kind of like how, and I think couture is a big part of it. Like when you take on a brand that is such a heritage brand and has such a big history, um, you know like what is expected and then also at the end of the day like fashion is a business like you've got to make money at the end of the day like is your deal like is the clientele coming because they want like the latest version of a couture bar jacket or sort of do they want something more so I think it's always interesting to see how people reinvent or like their approach what they think is relevant now mm. in terms of like house codes but yeah I think it was a like don't get me wrong I saw the clothes and thought that a lot of effort's gone into them and the focus really was on the fabric, but I do think it was quite like muted and I think it left a bit more to sort of be desired. But again, like very feminine as always. So like in that respect to so, like Dior's codes, I think, yeah. But in terms of like, if you want to sort of like a shock or if you want to be like wowed, maybe not this collection. Mm. Um, uh, moving on to Chanel. Uh, which I think is again a, a similar in a similar sort of situation. Again, another label that um, fashion, Twitter, and Instagram didn't seem to enjoy too much. Um, Alberto, what did you think of uh, Chanel? I think that um, yeah, it's uh... <laughs> you're going to be like Yasha. I really like the floor. <laughs> <laughs> No, I feel like Chanel is uh, has to 
answer to a specific clientele and has a name. So it's really difficult. Uh, so for sure, if it, it wasn't like exactly like, it wasn't like a shock or like, oh my God, like what am I seeing? Uh, there was one gar one look, uh, I feel like the last, one of the last ones that was quite interesting. There was, uh, um, but apart from the, apart from that, the rest is, uh, like maybe you wouldn't be able to say that it's uh, that one, the, not not the last one, the one with the the white the one, yes, and the white underneath. No, the one on the left. Oh, who would you think? Not white, though. <laughs> <laughs> the one, yes, this one. I thought this one was quite interesting because I think they tried to do a take, like, and I'm trying to make it a bit more modern. Mm. But yeah, it wasn't probably the show that. First of all, you, maybe you wouldn't be able to say that it's 2021 because this happened. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Juliet, what did you think of this Chanel? Um, I think it was a smart move to put it in the Palais Galeria because of the exhibition. Um, but yeah, we cannot see that much evening wear from far, I remember. It was mostly mm. day wear. I think it's like Dior in a way. They, there's no parties going on anymore or in the past year, of course. Um, no ceremonies, no weddings, so they kind of just answer to their clientele's needs, which is mostly day wear, um, and kind of dropped off the, I don't know, the, the party dresses or, or the, the waffles or the, um, but there is a bit of, I don't know, we can find it with the, the choice of fabrics. Um, yeah. I think she, she mostly got inspired um, Virginie Villard uh, with artists who co collaborated with Chanel. Yeah, um, and petticoats and a and the twenties and thirties in particular. Yeah, that, that was the one. Um, yeah, I don't know, sort of um, nostalgia of it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm quite confused. I'm quite puzzled. Every time I see a Chanel show, I I don't even know what to say about it. It feels like the same regularly. So. Yeah, yeah. It's it's also like Armani. Armani Privé is a, again a challenging label to to I guess unpack or talk about because it seems like it's very focused on its uh, final client and you know who cares if we understand it or not or if we like it or not and I, I think there's something of that a bit in Chanel but you know this Chanel couture show is there to sell more handbags and perfume so I just think there is a little bit of a misstep here there's a missed opportunity to perhaps engage engage um, us a little bit more um, before we wrap up, I wanted to look at uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier. Um, so let's stay with the French designers. But obviously Jean-Paul retired in uh, January last year, but kind of hasn't retired. Um, you can still buy the perfumes by the bucket load, but the Couture line would, is remaining open and in operation. Um, it's a part of the business that I guess was doing the most well. Um, but uh, in, a, in, a, in the spirit of collaboration that seems to have been kickstarted, I think by Dries van Noten and, and Christian Lacroix, who collaborated um, a few seasons ago, there is this new renewed, and obviously we have Mrs. Prada and Ralph Simmons, you know, there's this really exciting space we're in at the moment where major label um, uh, designers are kind of getting together and, and, and having Zoom calls and coming up with collections, uh, namely um, Sakai. Uh, Sakai's creative director was invited to take over this collection. Uh, apparently Jean-Paul had nothing to do, didn't really see anything until the show itself, didn't want to be involved too much, was very open to it being a sort of, uh, you know, to being her vision. Um, what did you all think of it? I mean, I think it's a, it's an interesting thing to do right now because everyone is wearing Jean-Paul Gaultier, um, things from his archive, the kind of, you know, body con and the mesh um so i think it's probably not easy um but also there's so much to play with and i think you really can kind of see the the silhouettes from sakai from the designer um she kind of yeah brought her her um her silhouettes to it and that kind of the mishmash and the the, the flowiness of it that i thought was really interesting and that kind of I don't know, is it normally there as much? Well, I think Sakai is normally known for its chopping up of hybrids, you know? So you have a jacket kind of, two different styles of jacket hacked together, you know, there's a kind of violence to the way the archetypes are treated that end up looking very beautiful. And I thought what was really nice is that 
she was doing that, but she was doing that with uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier's archive. So you have all these iconic things being kind of made into Frankenstein, beautiful opulent garments together. So they're all sort of, ha so we're recognizing bits and bits and bobs of it all. I think also there was something she interesting, she said that she didn't really need to look at the archive because it was kind of burned in her head already, you know, because Jean-Paul Gaultier was so influential, um, is so influential and was so influential to her. So I thought that was something quite nice about that as well, because so often we hear of this, I went into the archives and I looked at this and this and this, but there seems to be a move away from designers admitting to doing that now. There's a couple of others I can't remember off the top of my head. I think even maybe, maybe Peter Elias sort of said, I didn't look at the archives. You know, it's like, well, sure, no, but I'm sure, you know, your Instagram feed would have served you lots of images on your explore page because it's listening to you and will serve you what it's listening and what it's hearing. And um, so I wondered kind of that idea of that arrogance almost like, oh, I didn't look at the archives, I just kind of knew what I was gonna do. Um, in this case, it really paid off because it was a very respectful meeting between the two. And Matthew, what did you make of this collaboration? Um, I, re I, I like it. I think it's really, really nice actually. I think it's done really well. And I like the fact that she had um, a doppelganger of Jean-Paul Gaultier in there as well. Um, I think as well, it seemed fun. And I think that's what you, if you're going to go to like um, Jean-Paul Gaultier in Couture as well, that's that kind of like a whimsical take on it all. And I think she kind of captured that, but also was able to be like, the models are serious, but I'm giving you like fun. I'm giving you drama. I'm giving you like glam. And she, she met the brief. <laughs> and did you feel like the Couture season uh, totally kind of maintained that? Did it give you fun? Did you get what you wanted from it? Did, it, did you um, get fantasy or was it not that? Um, some glam. Not so much, not some, some things not so glam. Um, Victor Moore was interesting to look at as always. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's pretty close. <laughs> Alberto, did you get what you needed from the couture shows? Did they serve what we wanted? Did they do the job to Julia? They do the job. They, I think they do the job for their clients. And unfortunately, I'm not one of those. So <laughs> <laughs> this is the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think these, uh, what we just looked at, is going to impact um, future uh, fashion in a wider sense? Do you think it's going to change the the way any of us are going to dress, or the sort of editorials we'll see, or the sort of uh, ready-to-wear collections? I think that it's really interesting. Is it is it to, to me the question? To an, any of you, yes, please. Go on. <laughs> but yeah, no, I was saying that I think that to go back to what you were saying is that it's really interesting this element of collaboration just because it feels that the designer is not anymore this uh, amazing hero at the top of the pyramid so i think that for sure we, we did mention the democracy before i think that this is a step that is going to help towards be more accessible and more interesting and more uh, affordable so we'll wait for these ideas to trickle down and see how they influence <laughs> us in the long run um, maybe we'll see them in TK Maxx soon, Yana, hey? Um, thanks to all of you for joining and thank you so much for tuning in. Um, for extensive Fashion Week coverage, obviously you can stay on showstudio.com and look also at our YouTube channel. Uh, please do comment and let us know what you think. Um, we really want to carry on the conversation with you about Couture. It's the conversation and a question that never goes away. Um, but I think maybe we need that fantasy and that escapism now more than ever. Uh, I know I'm certainly missing it. Um, but again, until next time, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>